I am a criminal. I'm wanted. I'm on the run, at least in Tanzania. The local mafia has tried to kill me many times by poisoning, destroyed the brake of my car, and other ways. I have been arrested three times. What is the reason that I'm wanted? Because I work with human rights and education. To tell you my story, we need to go back to Rwanda 1995. I went from Norway, the safest place on earth, to a place that had experienced the worst war and genocide in modern times. The war between Hutu and Tutsi. But guess what? When UN asked me to go, they gave me three hours to think about it. I had never thought about going to Africa before. I was thinking, okay, I quickly called them back and I said, yes, I will go. Walking out of the flight at Kigali Airport, I saw wonderful green hills, colorful trees, very blue sky, it was so beautiful. I was in heaven. I walked down the steps from the aeroplane. I fell to hell. I saw a skinny dog with a leg in his mouth. A human leg. A human leg with a shoe on. To give you an impression about how horrible the genocide was, please consider this. A machete is a practical handy tool used for many purposes in Rwanda. During the genocide, more than one million people were killed by machetes, knives or guns, just in three months. The Catholic Church was strongly involved. The homicide rate was quicker than the Jews was killed under the Second World War. At the orphanage I worked, located in a bombed factory, children from babies up to around 16 years had sought safety. They had seen their family members being raped, tortured and killed. Many of them were sexually abused. They were in terrible condition, physical and mental. The rebels used soldiers with HIV as a strategy to rape and infect the civil population. Can you imagine your little daughter being raped and infected by HIV? 20 years after the genocide, I went back to Rwanda. I got a taxi, the driver was very nice, so I decided to use him every day. We went back to one of the churches where the most horrible massacre had happened. Around 5,000 people were slaughtered in this church alone. I went into the Sunday school room where 30 small kids had sit and listen to the stories from the Bible. The rebels attacked on sign from the priest. They held the babies upside down crushed their heads into the cement walls until they stopped screaming, dead. I could almost hear them and feel the smell of the dead body. I was 20 years back. My taxi driver had now understood that I had been in Rwanda before. He was very quiet. So I told him my UN story. I saw his tears were coming. He started to tell his story. I was 12 years under the genocide. The whole family stayed together in one house. The rebels came with their machetes. First, they raped the mother and one of the grandmother, while the rest of the family had to watch. Then they cut the father and grandfathers behind the knees and left them in pain with a promise that during 24 hours they will be back and finish them all. As promised, the rebels came back. That was hours with horror, blood and pain. My taxi driver 
managed to hide in a cupboard. He saw his family members were cut to pieces. After that, he can't remember anything. He found himself running and running, had no idea where he was. He ended up in a place, a bombed factory, where many people, many children, were hiding. While he was telling this story, I started to feel something strange. So I asked him, where is the factory? It was in, in, at Giseni. And you and people had discovered their kids' hiding place and rescued them. I start to tremble. I said, do you rem remember some of these UN people? Yes, they were from Norway. And one lady with a curly hair took special care of me. He looked into my eyes and he said, you remind me about her. It was unbelievable. He was my little David 20 years ago. I said, yes, it was me. We fell to each other's arms while he was crying and said, you are my mother, I don't have any family. After Rwanda, my plan was to travel around one month in Tanzania. So far, I have lived in Tanzania 13 years now. Africa is a wonderful continent with a lot of beautiful sides. But as an aid worker, it's very hard to cope with the culture, tradition, and daily corruption. The Lutheran Church asked me to work as a volunteer at a local hospital. The hospital was in horrible state. No electricity, no water. The pipes were broken two years ago. It was two, three patients in each bed mixed with malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS, and other diseases. I even saw some of them were already dead. There were no staff on duty, because they had not gotten their salaries the last four months, except the treasurer and his beautiful, sexy secretary. It was horrible to be at this hospital. So, something had to be done. So, I sold everything I had in Norway. I brought a medical doctor, medical equipment, and I started to work at this hospital as a volunteer. HIV AIDS was one of the biggest problems at the hospital. The local Lutheran culture had told everybody that only bad people got AIDS. Therefore, it was totally ignored. The knowledge about HIV AIDS was like zero. Nobody was talking about it. So, to do something with this, I start AIDS seminars. The church didn't like it at all. They tried to boycott it every time. I was not allowed to announce it. I was not allowed to organize it. But after a hard start, I managed to, um, to start via the Jungle Telegraph. However, the church, they sent their priests as spies to listen in what was said on the seminar. Words like sex and condom was totally forbidden. How can you prevent HIV AIDS without using these words? One day, I walked to the village center and I saw this in a hedge. Rent a condom here. <laughs> what was this about? Well, during my first seminar, I had handed out free condoms. One of these 445,000 I smuggled in from Norway. So, one had tried to make a business out of it. And other time, I showed them a condom and explained how important it is to protect themselves. 
a furious pastor raised up and said, don't believe that white terrible lady. The truth is, this cruel thing called condom is made of rubber. And when man and woman have sex, it will be friction. And your penis will burn up man. So, after years trying to educate people and fighting corruption, I saw that more than 90% of the donations to the, to the HIV AIDS projects went into someone's pockets. The church system, I learned to know, has nothing to do with Christianity. It's real bad business. So finally, I was angry enough to confront one of the pastors with this. Where are the human rights? What does this mean to you, pastor? And what about the Ten Commitments? He raised up, grab, grabbed my arm, twisted it, looked hard into my eyes and said, I am a pastor, you have to respect me, or it will be very dangerous for you. That evening, I was close to die of poisoning. From that day, I understood I had very dangerous enemies. That is why I am a criminal. And that is why I'm in danger when I'm down there. After stop work at the hospital, I start to work with children and youth. 300 kids at the primary school and 150 youth drop off from school, street children and orphans. I always ask them, what do you want to be? They never understand the question. After a year, this Stephen knocked at my gate. He had put his nicest clothes on, his eyes were shining, and proud he say. Now I understand your question, Mama Tuna. I want to be a lawyer, and I want to work with human rights. I helped him. He's now on his second year at the university, study law. <laughs> Jamila was 14 years raped by the teacher, got pregnant. She was kicked out of school forever, because now she was a bad girl. She was also kicked out from the family. She came to me and asked for help. She had to prostitute. How could she else find food and clothes for the baby and herself? I don't call this prostitution. I call it survival sex. I established a cleaning unit at the primary school I run together with the government and gave Jamila a job as a cleaner. One day she said, I really had a dream one time to be a teacher. I got her a sponsor, a nanny for the baby. I faked her name and address and sent her far away so she could continue her education. Today she is a teacher the best you can think of. Her dream came true. <laughs> Today, I can see that my school feeding program, acting drama group, um, healthcare program, and sponsorship for education has shown fantastic results. I have educated teachers, carpenters, masons, one is now study medicine, two study law, and these two girls study homeopathy in Kenya. Human rights, especially the right to education, especially for girls, is the main key out of poverty. I travel around with my drama group. We play theater all over, most in Kilimanjaro, where we live. You see Jamila in the mid with the white. We show them um, theater and drama as information about HIV AIDS, environment and human rights. I love my work with the children and youth. I strive every day to find their hidden talents. You have to see the individuals. I have never been so poor 
in my purse, but never so rich in my heart. Thank you.